Welcome back. Up to this point in the series, we haven't really talked about numerical methods, and this isn't a numerical methods class. That being said, Python has particular libraries and some coding tips that would be really helpful for using numerical methods to solve engineering problems in Python. The number one tip is don't reinvent the wheel. Um, libraries like Scientific Python or SciPy have hundreds of numerical methods which have been developed for speed and accuracy and they've been debugged and tested extensively and you should use them. Uh, so SciPy has functions for interpolation, optimization, integration, signal processing, special functions, and a bunch of other things that I haven't mentioned here. For a complete list, you can look at this SciPy book link or just go to the SciPy library itself. Um, but all we're going to do in these videos is look at a couple of key examples. So first up is ordinary differential equations. SciPy has a number of integration routines for integrating the area under a curve defined by an array or by a function. Um, but integrating an ODE is a little more tricky, and so I think it's worth going over. So the prototypical ordinary differential equation is one that's only got one derivative, so usually that's considered to be t, although it could be anything, and that'll be equal to some function of time and the variable y itself. The simplest ordinary differential equation for sure is that the rate of change of y is just equal to y itself. And even if we start at time zero with one example of something like this, we know from personal experience now that the result here is exponential growth. So we expect y to grow exponentially with time. And this is about the easiest way to start. So let's use this as our warm up example. Well, there are a few different ways to integrate ODEs with Python. I like solve IVP. So we can look at the signature for that. It takes in a function as the first argument and then a span of time that you want to integrate over and the initial conditions. So this Y zero here. Okay, so all straightforward. So here's our example. We've defined the right-hand side of the ODE. In this case, I've used a lambda function and I've just put in the value y itself. Then I've got the initial condition. This needs to be an array or a list, even though we only have one in this case. And we'll talk about that more later. Then the span of time I've used as a list and we enter that in to solve IVP. So here's the result. There's a nice message that tells you that it worked and you can see that it's returned an array of t values and also an array of y values. So that array of t values is 1d, it's a 1d array, but the array of y values is a two-dimensional array. So if we had n time steps, this will be n by however many variables you have. Even though now we only have one variable, it's still a 2d array and that can trip some people up. So let's plot that up. Here I've made a plot where we've got the exact solution, which is just t versus e to the t. To plot our numerical solution, we can just take sol.t, that'll give us the time instances, and sol.y. But this isn't going to work because that's a 2D array, and matplotlib requires a 1D array for a 1D input, and so we can just slice it at zero. And there's the result. We can see that solve IBP has given us a really accurate solution, but it's kind of spread out weirdly. Uh, and that's because it uses an adaptive time step by default, but we can tell it to evaluate at whatever time step we want. So here, this is exactly the same function we used above, except I'm giving it the same even distribution of points that we used for the exponential exact curve. And now we get back a nice distributed set of points for the plot. Great, so now we know the basic syntax of solve IVP, but for any real engineering system, that simple, simple exponential growth is probably not enough. Um, even for something very straightforward, like this prototypical mass spring damper system, the governing equation is second order. So we've got the acceleration times the mass, plus the damping times the velocity, plus the stiffness times the displacement, 
is balanced by the forcing on the system. This has a second derivative, not just a first derivative, and solve IVP can't handle second derivatives out of the box. So we're going to need to adapt this into a problem with only first derivatives. All we need to do is define a new variable, which is not just the displacement, but also the velocity. So it'll combine those two states of the oscillator together. This reduces the system to a first order ODE because the derivative of the state is just given by the velocity itself, which is y1, and the kind of reorganization of this oscillator equation, which is all in terms of y1 and y0 and the constants of the system. This is a completely general process. So no matter how many derivatives you have, you can always assign enough states to reduce that down to a first order equation. And that's why routines like solve IVP expect an array of inputs and they'll be spitting out an array of outputs, one for each state. So let's implement it. Uh, the force we can just assign to be a sine wave with a frequency two pi. We can give values for the mass damping and stiffness, and then we can define the linear oscillator ODE. The only additional kind of coding trick here I've done is that I'm using this adaptive time step for the span to go from 0 to 42 cycles, but then I'm only evaluating it from 40 to 42. So I'm skipping the ramp up period and the plot will just focus on the last few cycles. So that's a nice way of using the adaptive time step capability. And there's the result. We can see that we get two sine waves like expected. But the most important thing about using numerical methods is that you need to make sure to sanity check your results. Are these results reasonable? So for instance, we've got a forcing function with a frequency of one hertz here. And so we should expect the results to also have a response of one hertz. And indeed we do. So from 40 to 42, we get two cycles. As engineers, we can do a little better than this as far as checking the results. So we could say that the amplitude of this would be approximately equal to the force divided by the stiffness if we could ignore the velocity and acceleration terms, the dynamics. So the static response would be this force divided by stiffness. And if we run the numbers on that, we see that that should have been an amplitude of 0 0.025. But instead here, we're seeing a displacement amplitude of around 0.4. So what's going on here? From an engineering point of view, you should always be looking for these ways of checking your results. In this case, what's happened is we've set the natural frequency of the oscillator to match the forcing frequency. And so we're at resonance. So this simple statics approach isn't going to be a good estimate. And we can test that out now. We have this ability to change the parameters in this equation, and I want you to do that. So as your first exercise, I want you to lower the forcing frequency by a factor of 10. That should take you out of resonance, and you should see an amplitude of around 0.025. If you don't, there's something wrong. The next thing I want you to do is reset the frequency and change the mass, increase it by a factor of 10. And I want you to predict what should you get out of that situation and then run the simulation and see if you were right. Finally, for this kind of linear harmonic oscillator, we know the exact solution response, um, but it's very simple to change this equation by adding a nonlinear term. For instance, I'm adding here a nonlinear damping term, the way you might get fluid damping. And that's enough to turn this into something that would be very difficult to solve analytically, but it requires almost no change to our numerical approach. And that, again, is what a big advantage of doing these kind of things numerically. So here, the only thing I've changed is the ODE, and I run exactly the same code otherwise, and I get this nice nonlinear response. We can see that the frequency is still locked into the forcing frequency, but now we don't have a sinusoidal response anymore, clearly something nonlinear happening. So the next class of problems we're going to discuss are root finding methods, which are really useful for solving implicit equations. So if you have a function like this blue one, the roots of that function are all the places where it crosses zero. So we're looking for values of x 
which will give us a zero of our target function. While there are different functions to do this in SciPy, fsolve is a good general choice. As before, the first argument is a function. The next one is an initial condition. So this kind of method requires some starting point x0. And that initial condition is important because if your function has more than one root, which one you end up at is going to depend on this initial condition. To demonstrate that, let's use a sample function x times sine x. So that'll have all the same zeros as sine x, which is at multiples of pi. So we've looped through different values of xo, 1, 3, 5, 7, and the roots that it's found are 0 times pi, then pi, which is close to 3, but then 5 pi, which is not particularly close to the starting point of 5, and then 2 pi, which is pretty close to 7. So this is a good warning sign here. The initial condition for these kind of methods really is important, especially for functions with more than one root. And sometimes the results can be somewhat surprising. So as I said, one of the best uses of root finding in fsolve is to deal with implicit equations. These happen all the time in engineering. An explicit equation is one where you can solve directly for a variable algebraically. But a lot of times when there's some kind of feedback in the system, then the thing you're trying to solve for appears more than one place in the equation and it can't be isolated. For example, pipe flow. So in this case, we've got the flow through a pipe that flow has a certain velocity and viscosity. And then the pipe has a diameter and some kind of roughness. And what we're interested in is measuring the friction, the Darcy friction factor of that pipe. So it's defined by this implicit equation where we have square root of f appearing both on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. The other factors of interest here are that roughness to diameter ratio and the Reynolds number of the flow inside the pipe. Now, engineers usually solve this using something called a Moody diagram, where basically you've let somebody else deal with the difficulties of this equation, and you can just look up results. But using fsolve, we can solve this ourselves. And the way we can always turn an equation like this into a root finding problem is simply by subtracting everything on the right-hand side, moving it over to the left-hand side. And when f satisfies the equation above, the result will be zero. Therefore, we can use a root finding method to find the value of f that satisfies our original equation. And here's how we can implement that. So we've defined a function, Darcy. The inputs are the Reynolds number and that roughness ratio, as well as an optional input for the starting point for our root finding method. Then inside Darcy, we define this function that we want to take the root of. So this is exactly the same as the equation above. And then we apply that in fsolve using our initial guess and return the root. This trick of passing in arguments into one function and then using them as constants in another function is a really nice way of wrapping up root finding methods. And I use it a lot because now Darcy will act just like an explicit function for f, the Darcy friction factor. And we don't even need to know about the internal workings of that. So here I've passed in a Reynolds number of a million and a roughness of 0.1%. And the result we get out is 0 0.02. And if you check the Moody diagram, that's correct. In fact, now that we have this function, we should be able to make our own Moody diagram. So to fill in our version of the Moody diagram, we need to sample across Reynolds number and also across roughness. And since these things are usually done on a log log scale, that's what we're going to do as well. So we're going to plot this using plt log log. That'll give us a log log plot. And we're also going to sample the roughness and the Reynolds number using a logarithmically spaced array instead of a linearly spaced array, which would look bunched up on a log log plot. So after getting our array of Reynolds number, we loop through all the different roughnesses. We solve for the friction factor using our formula above and then we plot it up. Let's try it. That doesn't work. <laughs> the problem here is that we've tried to pass an array of Reynolds numbers to our Darcy function. And remember in NumPy, functions like sine, those broadcast across arrays. So if you pass them an array, they'll just evaluate sine at each one of the elements of the array, and then they'll send you back an array. 
but that won't work for our function because we haven't told it how to broadcast. Luckily, that's very easy to do with NumPy with something called decorators. So decorators are a really nice way of adding capabilities to your function without coding them yourself. In this case, the NumPy vectorized decorator will just add this broadcasting ability to our function, and that's all we have to do. So if we reevaluate this function, now we can see the output is an array. That's a good sign. And if we run it through, there's our Moody diagram. So if we compare this to the normal Moody diagram, then we'll see that it does match. Uh, also note, we haven't used the default pie plot color scheme here. Instead, we've used a sequential color scheme because that tells you that as you increase your roughness, you also increase your friction factor. So that gives the viewer a hint, a visual cue as to what's going on. So now that we've made that Moody diagram, it's your turn. So I want you to write a function to solve this implicit equation. This is actually the equation that defines Cassini ovals. And you should be able to write an implicit equation solver very similar to the Darcy solver above that solves this given theta and b for the radius r. And you can test it with this condition I've given you here. And you should also be able to reproduce some of the plots on this link. So that's great. We've looked at a lot of programming techniques that let us utilize numerical methods in SciPy to solve engineering problems. But probably the most important technique is the idea of breaking down a complex problem into simple problems that you already know how to solve with the programming stuff you've done before. So the example we're going to use to demonstrate this is a boundary layer flow. So the physical situation here is that we have the laminar flow of fluid of water or air past a flat plate. When that happens, the fluid's going to stick to the wall. So we're going to have no velocity right on the wall. But when we're some distance above the flat plate, we should recover kind of that flow speed, which we're calling capital U. So these flow vectors get bigger very quickly as we move away from the wall. And this thin region of slow moving fluid is called the boundary layer. So the governing equation for this profile shape is called the Blasius equation. It's the third derivative of some function a plus one half times a times a second derivative equals zero, where the profile shape itself is defined as the first derivative of a, and that's the non-dimensional profile shape and this is a function of z, which is some non-dimensional distance away from the wall. This is a third order ordinary differential equation where we're going to need some boundary conditions. The first boundary condition is that a prime will be zero on the wall. We'll also have a zero on the wall. That's kind of the condition that we won't have any flow through the wall. And then our last condition is that far away from the wall, this value of a prime must asymptote to one because of the fact that we have this kind of constant flow velocity outside the thin boundary layer. So this is a pretty complicated equation. It's not the sort of thing you can solve analytically. We've got a third order nonlinear ordinary differential equation, pretty tricky. But we can break this up into two easy steps and solve it numerically. So we've already seen the first step. We just need to define a state vector, which is holding a, its first derivative, and its second derivative. And that'll let us reduce this third order differential equation down to a first order equation. Of course, we also need the initial conditions for this solve IVP. And we know the value of a, and we know the value of a prime at zero, but we don't know the value of a double prime. But for now, let's just pretend we do. We'll set it equal to some constant c0, and we'll write the same exact kind of function we used above. We'll just have to pass in c0 as an input and figure that out later. So here we've written a lambda function, which defines the ODE. We'll integrate from zero up to the last point in our input span. We'll use our initial conditions, including our unknown C0, and then we'll evaluate at those points we've passed in. Finally, we'll just return the value here of Y1, because that's A prime, which is this profile shape we're interested in. We don't care about the other states. 
And here's our result. We can see that we get a velocity profile and it does look pretty much like we thought it should. So that's nice, kind of a sanity check there. We do see, however, that we haven't reached the asymptote that we wanted. We're asymptoting to two instead of to one. And that's because we've used the wrong guess. In this case, I've just guessed that that constant C0 was one, and that must be the wrong value. So our second step is determining that constant. And we can get that by satisfying that far field boundary condition. What we're looking for is the value of C0 so that when we return this Blasius call and we look at the last item in the list, we'll have the value one. That means we've reached our far field asymptote value that we want. Now, this is a very complex equation, Blasius. It's got a solve IVP code inside of it, but that doesn't matter. All we need to do is subtract the right-hand side from the left. And we can use that as our function inside F solve. So I've done that here. Here I've defined the lambda function. So we've got Blasius. We'll set the value we want to evaluate this at at 12, just being kind of far enough. You can't put infinity in here, unfortunately. And then we'll find the value of C0, such that the last value, when you subtract one from it, is a root of the equation. And if we run that, then we can see, indeed, our asymptote has got the value of one exactly as we wanted. So we've taken this really complicated nonlinear equation with mismatched boundary conditions, and we've solved it in two simple steps. First, we reduced it down to a system of first order equations with one unknown initial condition. And second, we solved for that unknown initial condition using FSOL. And in fact, that value C0 is physically important. It tells you how much skin friction there is on the plate due to the flow of water past it. So anytime you need to figure out how much drag there will be on an object due to friction, then you can just use this formula based on the Blasius equation. So it turns out the skin friction coefficient, it's 1.328 divided by the square root of the Reynolds number. That's it. So a really quick hand calculation but it's only achievable after you found this value C0, and that's really only achievable using numerical methods.